Um, I'm Dave Babcock, and um, I'm going to be conducting today's second training session for docents. I know some of you uh, who have been volunteering for a while, and some of you I don't know, but over the next couple hours, hopefully, we'll get to know each other a little bit better. Um, the whole point of today is to do a follow-on to the first docent training session that uh, Mike had done, and everyone's attended that session, I believe. Okay, and he, he talked about, you know, what are all of the logistics of giving a tour and, you know, setting up this and telling people about that and, and how we should flow and what the rules are and keep this door closed and so on. And he talked about content and he gave his tour, I believe, and showed how he gives a tour. And we thought it would be useful to have someone else give you a tour so you could see another approach to giving tours. Um, and in particular, now that I have you as a captive audience, we're going to do more than just the tour. I'm going to spend some time first and talk about my philosophy of giving tours and how I do things and get organized and so on. And then we're going to give a tour uh, that I call a training tour. I've actually never given this before. We're going to sort of make it up as we go. And it's going to be a mixture of a real tour as I would give it to people, but you as future docents, we're going to talk about options. So we'll go up and I'll talk about something like I'm giving the tour and then I'll say, oh, by the way, at times I'll talk about this. Or if you have a group interested, you can mention this. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about variations on the tour. So the tour itself is going to take more than the normal hour, but uh, you'll start to see what the flow is like. And, and the biggest thing I want people to come away today with is not just content. You know, you're not here to learn about some of the artifacts from me, but more concentrate on how to give a tour and what are some of the variations and, and so on for giving tours. So what I really am hoping for is that everybody here leaves with at least half a dozen good ideas or new ideas in how to go about giving a tour or how to prepare for it or how to connect with the audience and, and the people that you're giving the tour to. So I want you to sort of listen to what I'm saying in terms of how I present things and what I'm saying but I'd much rather you concentrate on style and presentation and that type of thing, just to get a better idea on, on how to give a tour and so on. So let me back off just a second and tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I've been a professional software developer for 31 years, and I've worked for just a few companies, Silicon Graphics and Rome and Hewlett Packard and a university, and I've done mostly compiler development. Uh, I've done some applications work. I've worked in a support group at a university dealing with faculty and staff. And I had the uh, unique opportunity that my advisor in college was Fred Grunberger. Now that may not be a household name in computers, but he actually is one of those key pivotal people in computer science. Um, he was there in the early days and he didn't invent anything or create anything new, but he documented it. Um, the ACM did a 50 year retrospective history a few years ago and they credited Fred in 1952 as writing the first user's manual for, for a commercial computer system. Um, he was at Rand Corporation and started a whole series of seminars back in the 60s of famous computer people and the best thinkers and, and engineers of our day coming and talking about the future and where should we go and what's happening in computing and like that. And he was the scribe who documented all that. So going to school in Los Angeles, I had the unique opportunity that as friends of his, the Grace Hoppers and those type of people would come to town to give lectures or talks or have meetings, Fred would take them out to dinner and I got to tag along. So early on in my career, I got exposed to sort of the pioneers in computing history and very sensitized to, to computing and computer history. And that's stayed with me through my 31 years. And then lo and behold, six years ago, I worked at Silicon Graphics. I was looking for something to do for me. I have six kids and I tend to get very busy with home things and I needed something for me to do and I found out about this museum and I've been volunteer for the last six years here. Um, I've done probably over a hundred tours, I did the website implementation and uh, a lot of the things that go on here at the museum I've had my fingers in. I, I tend to get involved with a lot of things. And I'm on the volunteer steering committee and when uh, Mike and John asked me to give this training session today I was really happy because I have a lot to, to share with you guys in sharing with the public. So that's sort of my background and, uh, and perspective on things. So again, the objectives for today is to focus on delivery and how to give tours and that type of thing more than just content. So, so 
when I think about a tour, I, I try and think about, because I'm an engineer, focus on the objectives. What are we trying to accomplish when we give a group of people a tour? And that can be a one-on-one -on -one tour, or it can be a large group, it can be a Saturday afternoon tour, or like this afternoon we have a special industry group coming that's very focused on a particular area of computing, that is the fourth language. And, and my perspective of the objective of giving people tours is to share the history of our industry with these people. Um, realistically, we're not going to turn them into computer historians in an hour. We're not going to fill their heads with lots of facts and figures and get them so pumped up about this happened on this date and that happened on that date. And that's not what's important. What we want to do is tell a story. In fact, I think some of the best docents that we have are people who are just naturally good storytellers. And we want to sort of weave in roughly an hour of their time, a story through the physical artifacts as we're walking through this building and give them some sense of what's going on, what happened in history, what sort of important, and so on. But we're not going to turn them into historians. One of the things I always think about is it's sometimes easier to measure things in a negative sense than a positive sense. And I want everybody who takes a tour from me to walk out the door and not feel like it was a waste of their time. And I don't care if this is, you know, the best computer geek ever or the wife of someone who doesn't know how to turn on a computer. I want everybody to feel like this was a good time spent at this place, that they learned something, they were educated. Uh, even if they don't understand the detailed technical aspect, they feel like they've learned something about computing and about how it's affected our lives and so on. So. Um, so I, I try and keep that as a focus, and one of the things I do is I try and identify people in the, in the tour group and, and make eye contact and personal contact and see if they're getting it. If I'm explaining things at too high a level or too low a level, and I'll adapt what I'm doing for the people in the group. And I really want you know, that little spark in their eyes of recognition, that I'll explain something and, and they'll go, I get it. Um, it. It's really neat for people who are non-technical if they finally understand something technical, they really have accomplished something, and they feel good about that. So I'll get a wife who doesn't know anything about electronics, and I'll explain something about the 6600 that's, that's technical. I'll simplify the explanation a little bit, but it's really a technical concept, and you'll just see that recognition in their face. They just sort of light up, and they've got it. So, so that's really important. The other thing is, I said, I want you people to walk away here with at least six new ideas of giving tours and what to do about tours and so on. But I have a little lower standard for the people on the tour. When they walk out the door, an hour later, they're not going to remember half of what we talked about. They're not going to remember facts and figures and numbers and dates and people's names. But I want to be able to, a month from then, you know, a month after they've taken the tour, to be able to call them up and ask them, what did they learn from the computer museum and have them tell me one thing that they learned. Pretty low standard, but I want different ways that no matter who's on the tour, something's going to connect for them and that they're going to remember it a month later and they're going to tell a friend, oh, by the way, I went on this really interesting tour, it's not a waste of your time, and, and I learned this. And it could be the smallest little thing about the history of computing that in the big things isn't that important, but it doesn't matter. They might have been educated. Now, part of what we do is to entertain them, too, but we're not going to get up here and do a song and dance, but we want to be able to present the information in an entertaining way. If you just talked for an hour and rattled off facts and figures, you know, everyone's going to be put to sleep, and then that's not what we're about. We want to sort of keep their interest and talk about things in a way that excites them. When I was in school, my worst subject was history. I just hated it because all it was was reciting facts and figures and names and dates. And I didn't understand what was going on, and I just hated doing that. As I've gotten older, one of my most interesting things is history. Because now what I focus in on is not so much the dates and so on, but the interactions, and how were people involved, and how were their lives changed. And when this was happening in this country, what was happening over there? And that's the kind of sense I want to leave people with who go on tours with me. I want to them with all the facts and figures that I know. And, and certainly, I only know a small portion of what's in this room. If you talk to one of the other senior docents, they have a different set of facts and figures. And this isn't a contest of how much you know. If someone really cares about what date this machine was, was started, they can go look at the, the signage or go look it up on the web. What's important
important for them to get in the hour tour is the sense of why is that machine important? Or how is that connected to something else? Or how does that affect me and my life? So, so that's what we want to focus in on. You'll notice as I give the tour, I will talk about facts and figures and dates and numbers, but I give what I call a soft <coughs> tour. That is, I focus more on the, the reasons behind things and the stories of the machines. And I put out enough facts and figures and numbers that when we have computer professionals, they get to hear the bits and the bytes and it makes it more concrete to hear specific numbers and dates. But I tend not to focus on that a lot. And I will give specific dates, but usually I'll talk about date ranges in the early 50s, or this happened before that happened, because that's what's really important here. Um, again, for these people to memorize that on a particular date something happened, that's, that's not what we want them to come away with. So, so that's really important. So I give these sort of soft tours rather than what I call a hard tour, which is just lots of facts and figures. Other docents in the museum are, are more comfortable with giving the hard tours and the facts and figures and numbers. And that's good, too. I'm not saying that one is right and the other one is wrong. What we want to do today is give you guys another perspective of giving tours besides what you saw Mike do. But ultimately, you're going to make up your own tours. And you're going to do things that feel comfortable to you. And you're going to find your own kind of medium ground of what, what needs to get done. So, any questions so far of, of what we're about today and what we're going to do? Anybody have any other expectations of what they'd like to see happen today? Or? Okay, good. So, so let me talk about what I think it takes to give a successful tour. In the six years I've been here, I've quite easily given over 100 tours, and no two of them have been the same. Every tour I've given has been slightly different, maybe greatly different, but certainly no two tours have been the same. There's certain things I always talk about. There's some things that I've learned over the years that are a better way to explain something than another way for me. And so I will often repeat the same kind of phrases or explanations on tours, but I really focus my tours on the group that's with me. I also experiment. Um, you know, I'll, I'll hear something new about something going on and I'll try a different way of explaining it to one tour group to see how it goes over another group. And I really want to focus in on how to customize or personalize the tour to the people who are with me. So one of the big, big things I do is plan and prepare. Okay? So th this is probably all the stuff you do ahead of time of giving the tour. And that is, you want to read background material. Now, we don't expect you to sit down and spend a hundred hours of reading all the history journals and so on, but come to these classes. Be familiar about things. Walk around and read the signage. Uh, look at our website and so on, and just get a general understanding of the artifacts that are here, about computer history, and, and different interesting things. One of the things I do when I read material is I start thinking about when would this be appropriate to tell people? Is this too technical? How does it fit in with other things? Do we have that artifact available? And I really try and think about every tour I give before I give it. And then the key phrase is once you're giving the tour, you want to be flexible. Even if you have an idea of how you want to flow the tour and what artifacts you want to show people, you may have to adapt that while you're going. But it still helps, in my, my experience, to have a plan that says, this is sort of what I want to show people, and I've sort of prepared myself for that. So let me give you another example of that. Um, we have a thing on our website called This Day in History. And when you go to the front page, the lower right-hand box of the four boxes on the front page is something that happened on this day in history. Now, unfortunately, we don't have it fully populated for every day in the year, but every week probably at least has something important going on. And when you go to the web page on a particular day, it will show you what happened on that day. And if you click on it, you go to another page with more detailed information. So one of the things I do for every tour I give, particularly the Saturday tours, is I go on our website ahead of time and try and find out if something important happened on that day or around that day. Because again, I can relate that to the people. So here's the trick. The website is geared to the date and time that your browser sees, and so it tells 
the web server, you know, what today is. And it works properly if you're in Japan and everything else. So, but there's a trick. There's a, a little command you can give on the top that says, no, pretend today is this date. Or even better, if you go to www.computerhistory.org slash T-D-I-H, this day in history, all lowercase, you'll see an FTP directory listing of that directory. And you'll notice that there is a separate directory for every month. And you click on a month, and you'll see separate directories for every day that has something in it. And then you can click on that, and you can go explore what it is that happened on that day. So I did that last night, and there was nothing for today, or yesterday, or tomorrow. But on Monday, there is actually two things. And so on Monday, September 30th, back in 1988, IBM announced the shipment of their 3 millionth PS2 computer. And of course, the PS2 was important because IBM had been shipping the PCs, and they had these ISA cards, and they had certain kinds of floppy disks and you know, five and a quarter inch floppy disks, and they had a certain graphic standard. And with the PS2, they were trying to move away from what had become a de facto industry standard and move to something that was more IBM specific. So they had the, the smaller three and a half inch floppies, and they had VGA for the interface, and they used um, this MCA channel adapter for their circuit cards. So, so there's an interesting piece of tidbit. And so what I would do is think about that in terms of, would that be appropriate to tell people on the tour? When we come around and we start pointing out the PCs and so on, that might be a good time to say, and oh, by the way, you know, 24 years ago on Monday, this thing happened. And, and that gives them a lot more connectivity to what's going on in history and, and it sort of plans things. The other one I like even better. 1941, September 30th, um, Mockley, John Mockley, wrote a letter to Atanasoff suggesting that they work together and share ideas. Now, for those of you who have read about it or lived through it, there was this big contention. In fact, there was a lawsuit and a trial to say who sort of came up with the concept of a modern computer. Was it Atanasoff and Barry? or was it Eckert and Mockley? And there was a trial about that, and ultimately Atanasoff won, but part of the winning was because Mockley had written this letter to Atanasoff saying, let's share ideas. You know, I want to see what you're doing, let's work about things. And this was one of the key points in the trial that helped swing the decision. So, you know, does it change history? No, but it, it gives credit where credit is due, and it's an interesting, point in history. So when we go to talk about, for example, the UNIVAC-1, the memory we have is the, uh, the uh, Mercury Delay Line memory. I don't usually talk about that on a tour. There's not enough time. But today, I would possibly stop there and mention that the UNIVAC-1 was done by Eckert Mockley, that it was used in 1952 to predict the presidential election between Adlai Stevenson and um, and the guy who won, <laughs> yes, uh, Eisenhower, <laughs> and how it had predicted it, and the, and the Walter Cronkite didn't believe the prediction, and so he refused to announce the results. And so you can tie all that together with their personal experience of this is what happens. We're coming up on elections in November. We had a presidential election in 52, Eckert and Mockley, the UNIVAC won, and this trial that determined who was that. And you can tie that to history. Now, two months from now, I won't say that because it's, it's sort of transient. And that's what I mean about giving a different tour at different times, that where you are in what you th are thinking about, what you've heard about, what's happening in history, who the group is that you're talking to, that's important. This afternoon, we're giving a special tour to the Silicon Valley Fourth Interest Group. Now, Fourth is a very interesting computer language that was developed by a guy named Charles Moore. And so last night, I went on the website and started poking around a little bit. And I used Fourth years ago, but I didn't know the whole history. So I, I spent half an hour and I read up on the history of Fourth. And in particular, I made a list from Charles Moore's own website of all the computers that he wrote fourth interpreters for. And we have some of them in the museum. And so one of the things I can do with the tour group this afternoon is point out, here's another machine. 
Here's the DDD, the DDP 116 that was the fourth machine that he wrote fourth for. And here's the, 11, the IBM 1130 that was the first machine he wrote fourth for. It only takes another moment while we're giving the tour to mention that. And I won't spend a lot of time talking about those machines, but I can relate now better to this group that's coming and what their interests are. So, so just you know, a few moments of time spent ahead of the tour in preparing and reading about things gives you that better connection and gives you the ability to give a better tour that's more personalized to the people who are coming. So those are the kinds of things. And, and if you talk to other volunteers, there's lots of other ideas of things that are going on and current events. And um, you know, if you know something about the group that's coming, you can prepare ahead of time. But even if you don't, I always try and do a little survey when people first come in the door and you're greeting them. And I say, so where are you from? What do you do for a living? What's your interest in coming here today? What was the first computer you ever worked on? Um, what kind of machine do you have at home? And you sort of get a sense for where the people are coming from and what they're interested in. And again, I can adapt the tour just ever so slightly to when we come by something, say, oh, you were talking about this? Well, we have one of those machines over here, or, or so on. Uh, same thing happens when we bring people in this room and they eye all the PCs and micros. Their, their eyes will light up and say, oh, I had one of those in school, or my dad had one of those, and so on. So if you can hear that from them ahead of time, you can make little decisions about how you want to do the tours. Now there's, there's a big debate that goes on with the museum on and off about um, should the tours be unique or should they be cookie cutter? Should we sort of give the same tour or should we give unique tours? And I firmly believe that unique tours is the right answer. I think that. That isn't held by everybody. And, and the arguments are, some people say, you want people to have a common experience. That if they tell a friend about the museum, and that's something they saw on the tour, and the friend comes a month later and gets the tour from somebody else, they'll see sort of the same things. And certain things are important enough, we want to make sure everybody hears about the ENIAC, that everybody hears about this. And I think that's fine, but how we give the tour is, is something that I feel very uh, strongly that we should personalize to ourselves and the people that, that we're giving the tour to. So um, I will select different items on the tour, and that's back to the planning, that I want to show to this group today. Plus, I get bored. If I were to stand up here and just repeat the same speech, we might as well tape record it and hand the recording to people to walk around the museum. You know, it's that personal contact and that eye recognition, and again, did they understand what I'm saying? Do I need to explain a little bit more? I tend to wave my hands a lot when I give the tour and, and try and explain things in a way that people understand. But if they seem to be getting it, then I move on to something else and I spend my time elsewhere. So you want to prepare, you want to personalize the tour to the groups. But most of all, you want to be yourself. I mean, we all have different strengths and weaknesses. We have different interests. And I think the biggest argument for having sort of tailored tours to every group is we're all different. And we have different ways of presenting things and different things that are important to us. Some can memorize dates better than others. And, and I think what you want to do when you make connection to the people on the tour is have that personal contact. And if you come across as being phony and not yourself and you're just sort of an automaton, you know, spouting a standard speech, that's not going to be enjoyable to people. And so you really want to engage them. Now, as new docents, uh, you know, one of the first things that happen is people go, oh my god, there's so much to know. I can't possibly learn enough to give a good tour, and you know, I'm going to embarrass myself or something. And, and that's not the case. You know, we only present a small piece of information in the, in the hour that we have people. And you are in control. You decide what it is you want to tell people. So you can tell them the stuff you feel comfortable with, and the stuff you don't feel comfortable with, you don't have to be telling them. Now, the only thing that may come up is someone asks you a question about what is this, or why was this, and you don't know. So you say you don't know. I mean, there's nothing that says we have to have the answers to everything. And as Mike, I'm sure, told you last, last session, the worst thing we can do is give out incorrect information. Don't make something up. Don't guess. If you're not sure, it's fine to say, I think that happened around this date. But don't say it happened on that date. Don't say this was the first thing or this was the most important thing. 
unless there's some real curatorial data to back that up. Because as we saw with the Atanoff, Soft, and Mockley trial, they both thought they were first. I've had, I had a one afternoon where I had a big argument with uh, Gwen Bell about which memory came first, core memory or selectron memory. And we both pulled out our own history books and we could both prove that we were right and the other one was wrong. Because it depended on how you defined it. What was the first one running in the lab? What was the first one in a commercial system? What was the first one to be demonstrated? And so it's really important because we are conveyors of history that we don't rewrite history. We're not revisionist about the history we present. But it's fine to generalize things and say, this happened about this time, or, or just flat out say, I don't know. That's, that's just fine. I've given, as I said, over 100 tours, probably thousands of public speeches and talks and presentations and training sessions, anywhere from one-on-one -on -one to thousands of people in an auditorium. And every single time I get nervous beforehand. I get these butterflies and my throat gets tight and it just, it really bothers me. But once I get into it and feel comfortable, it goes well. I'm also very shy. Um, when we have these social events, going up to someone I don't know and introducing myself is really hard for me. But I've learned to just, you know, push through it and then go forward with it. And once I make the contact, then I feel very comfortable with it. So we're not looking for people who are um, great at all of those social skills, but at least people who want to try, who want to share what they know, and, and to help share this place and the history of our industry with the people who come on the tour. And the more genuine you are, the more yourself you are, the more comfortable you are with the people and how you're saying things and what you're saying, the better the experience will be for the people on the tour. They will really get a lot more out of it than you just being there and spouting and reading from a script. As you learn more about the artifacts and the tours, you will keep changing and branching out and trying new things, and that's fine. If you want to start with your first tours and have an actual written list of here's the machines I want to show and the key points I want to say, that's fine to get started and get moving. But the more you can sort of feel comfortable with it, um, the more you'll enjoy it. And then over time, as you learn more, you'll keep changing. I just gave the tours last Saturday. And one of the other senior docents for the 1 o'clock tour followed me around and listened to what I said and afterward corrected me on a couple of things. Not hard facts that I was wrong about, but his perspective was, this was more important than this because, or this is what really, you know, and it was fine tuning and tweaking. And so I learned some new things, you know, just last week. So you have to be open to that and feel free to go ahead and try new things. As I said, I'll experiment with explaining things in a different way or bringing something else in that seemed to have worked or I just want to try it out to see if people like that or don't like it or how much time it takes. So, so you want to be yourself, but you've got to be flexible. You have to be willing to, as you're giving the tour, to adapt to the questions that are coming up and the people. Um, we will often have a problem where we have such a large group to give a tour to, we break them into two pieces, and one group typically starts in that room, one group starts in this room, and then they cross. And invariably, we never time it right. And so one group comes in while another group's here, and you were going to go over there, but now you need to go over here. Just go with the flow. That's fine. I mean, the, you know, this, there's not uh, tour Nazis around here that are going to say, oh, you didn't follow the pattern right. So just be flexible and comfortable. And it's sort of like taking a group of friends around here to show it off and to share with them. Not to show yourself off, but to share with them the stuff here. I always, yes? One question. Regarding, you know, you're going to obviously be asked questions that beats me. Right. Is there available a sheet of background sources they could read or get out on the net or something like that, that at various levels? Some, right. Because some of them would be little kids and some of them would be people that know more about it than we do sometimes. But right. they, is this sort of thing available that we can Not find currently. To? Not well, currently do we have physical handout material like that. We do have some material on the web. You know, if I know that it's on the website, I will say, well, go visit our web. Or I may suggest they do a Google search or something. Um, if they really care about knowing about it and you want to do some follow through, suggest that they write to the museum, some email, or um, 
add a note to the sign-in that they're interested in something or whatever. Um, but we don't have that kind of resource material available to us at this time. Okay. And so we don't have a list of books on the website you know, for further info? Not, not currently. And we don't even have a list of here's the ten sort of recommended books if you want to yeah. learn more about this subject. So that would be fun. That would be fun. We, we have a lot of things going on in the museum. Sure. One of them is building up this docent program. There's our physical facilities that John was talking about. And there's the web presence. And we really plan to have a massive cyber museum. Most people can't come to California. And even if they do, they want additional information. And we want to really build a tremendous web presence in this cyber museum. But we just haven't gotten enough traction to get that going yet. Well, is it a good place to start? The computer history website or what? I, I try to always recommend people start at our site. Because I would like to see us be sort of the first place people think of to go to for computer history. And then if we have pointers off to the Deutsches Museum or the London Science Museum, that's fine. Or point them off to other things. We don't have all those links yet, but I still really encourage people to, to go hit our site first and, and, and sort of browse around. But you're right, we don't have those lists. Even for docents, we're trying to develop lists of things. This book is, is, is fairly new with information about the artifacts, but we want to have some additional reference material. We've talked about having a reference library that the docents can check out books if they want to read more about uh, the history of IBM. They can check out one of Pew's books or, or so on. And we're just still trying to get all this stuff up and going. So we're really at the, the initial stages. So the last thing to say about tours before we actually go out into the room and start sort of doing a tour is remember that you're in control. So you're the one who decides where you go next, what you talk about, what level you talk about. I always encourage people to ask questions along the way. But there are times when the questions get either too detailed or they keep going on and on that you just cut it short. And you can do that in a polite way of saying, can we talk about that afterward? We're on a schedule here to get through and show off everything else. And, and most people are fine with that. But you are really the one in control. And that, for many people, gives them a, a better comfort feeling that, again, if they don't know something about certain machines, you can walk past it. And you can sort of point out, and here's some more mini computers, and, and go on. Because realistically, in an hour or 45 minutes, by the time you really talk about the core part of the tour, there's not much time to talk about you know, a small fraction of this, this stuff. So you can really pick and choose the stuff that you know and that you like and care about. OK? So let's go out to the front by the ENIAC, and let's, uh, let's do a tour. So welcome to the Computer History Museum. Uh, I'm Dave Babcock, and I'm going to be your docent guide for today. And we're going to spend about the next hour, actually 50 minutes, walking through this place and sort of sharing a piece of computer history with you. And um, there's a few little logistic items I have to mention first. One is no touching and no leaning. <laughs> um, it, it's really tempting. You know, th this is a temporary warehouse setting. This is not a permanent museum. We are going to be moving to permanent facilities over the next several years where we'll have regular signage and things behind ropes and like that. But I actually like this better because you can get really close and, and personal with these machines. But it is so tempting. Um, this is my career. You know, I've spent 30 years in this field, and I've worked on a lot of these machines, and it's so natural to go up and flip the switches. But you'll notice the docents carry white gloves, and if we do go to open something or, or show something off, we must use this so that fingerprints don't destroy the artifacts. In the case of an emergency, and you hear uh, the alarms going off or you smell, smell smoke, follow me out the door or the other workers of the museum. We have a couple of exits and we'll just lead you out of here and uh, get you out safely. And for those who need it, there's a bathroom under that exit sign. In general, I tend to just sort of go through the tour, but if at any time you have any questions or comments, feel free to raise your hand, interrupt me, and, and talk about something or ask a question. If you don't, I'm just going to keep going because I get really excited by all this. I mean, it just really pumps me up to share this with people. And so I tend to keep talking and I'll talk fast. If you have a hard time understanding me, slow me down, please. But um, I want to try and share as much of the history as I can. When we started in this place, we had things roughly in chronological order. But as we've added new artifacts, we've had to sort of fill them in to the cracks. And I should point out, what you're going to see today is only a small portion of the collection. 
This is maybe 5% of the whole collection in terms of physical artifacts. We also have manuals, books, tapes, films, videos. Um, I, I believe we have the largest collection in the world of historic computing artifacts. And we ha we're actually housed in several different warehouses. So you only see a small part of what we've got. And, and this is one that's sort of a pivotal machine. Um, and we're going to, from here, talk about what happened in history afterward and before it. This is the ENIAC, or a portion of the ENIAC. And this was built in the early 1940s when we were in the Second World War. And the Army had this problem of needing to do ballistic calculations. And they literally had room full of, of women, typically, with calculators and tables who were generating computational results, ballistic tables that could be used out in the field. And these people were called computers. And, and clearly, they couldn't do that much calculation. It was very error prone. So the military came up with the idea of building an electronic device to do the calculations. And so the Army contracted with the Moore School of Engineering to build the ENIAC. And this is only one small piece of it. We have here a picture of the whole thing. It was about 40 of these panels, all tubes. And it was the first all-electronic calculating device, as far as we're aware. Now, it wasn't considered a computer by today's standards because you program the machine literally by rewiring it. It could only store um, a few dozen numbers in it, and all of the actual calculations were done by setting switches and wiring, and you literally had to walk around the room and rewire the machine to do a certain set of calculations. Then they'd feed in a deck of cards with specific data on different size shells and, and angles and temperatures and so on. It would compute the results, punch out new cards, and then they would literally rewire the machine. And depending on the changes, that could take several hours, several days, or a week or so. And it was typically done by women because most of the men were off at war in World War II. The machine itself was completed just at the end of the war and didn't really participate in the war effort, but it was used for some of the analysis and, and computation for the atomic bomb project. And that's where a guy named John von Neumann comes in. Von Neumann was one of the best mathematicians around at the time, and he was in charge of the computation for the atomic bomb project. And one of the first things he did was go around to all the different government sites and, and universities to figure out what are you doing in terms of computing, and what's the next thing coming, and what can we use to do our computation. And in building this machine, the designers came up with the idea that, you know, this is really time consuming to keep physically rewiring the machine. What if instead of rewiring it, we replaced all these switches with relays and somehow stored in the computer's memory coded instructions that told the machine how to set these relays and the machine could sort of self-program it itself. And so they explained their idea to John von Neumann and he sat down and he wrote a report that was the preliminary specification for the next generation machine called EDVAC. And it, he put his name on this preliminary report. Unfortunately, they never did the final report to give credit to all the people who had really come up with the idea. Von Neumann was more the scribe, but he's incorrectly attributed as being the father of the modern stored program computer, but only because he really had written down the idea that these other people had come up with. When the war was over, von Neumann went back to Princeton, where he was a professor at the Institute for Advanced Studies, and he started planning and working on the design with a team of people for a computing machine that would be an automatic stored program computer. And that machine was the IAS machine. It's, it's, it's sort of the, the um, a generic term for it. And they had to share the design of that machine with other government installations and contractors. And there were about 20 instances of this IAS Princeton class machine built. And one of them was the Joniac. Uh, the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica was a big IBM shop. And they had all this IBM punch card gear. And in the late 40s, when this whole notion of stored program computing came up, they went to IBM, to Tom Watson Sr., and said, are you guys going to build stored program computers? We really want one. And Tom Watson Sr. repeated his famous remark, no, IB would not build stored program computers because he felt there was only enough worldwide market for a handful of these machines. Okay, I have, between my watch and my Palm Pilot and my pager, I probably have more 
programmed computers on me than Tom Watson Sr. thought were going to be in the whole world. And he said, IBM will not build such a machine. So places like RAND were forced to build their own version. And so RAND took the design from Princeton and built their own instance of it called the Johnny Act. And they named it after John von Neumann. And he was actually ticked that they named it after him because he didn't think he deserved that recognition because he didn't invent the concept. But as I said, there was 20 different versions. The Iliac, the, the Ciliac, the Maniac, they all sort of ended in IAC, built around the same time on the same basic design, but everybody tweaked the design so that none of the machines were compatible with each other. When the Johnny Act was first designed, if you did the mathematical calculations of the number of components and their aging factors, the calculated mean time between failure of this machine was 10 minutes. Not very acceptable. So what RAND chose to do, and they were doing this on a shoestring budget in the, engineer, in the mathematics department, is they were very conservative in the electronics. Everywhere they could, they were very conservative design. They removed things from the hardware that they could do in software. And they, they built an asynchronous machine, not a synchronous machine, which is more reliable and it keeps running as components age at different rates. And when they actually built this machine, it had several hundred hours mean time between failure. And so from the mid-50s to the mid-60s that this machine operated, they, they kept refining it and adding back into the hardware things they had taken out. It started with 256 words of tube memory, selectron tube memory in the top. And once core memory was invented, they replaced it with core. They replaced part of the arithmetic unit that was built with tubes with transistors once transistors were invented. I mean, this machine was created before we had core and transistors and certainly not integrated circuits. But it was a very powerful machine for its day, and RAM got a lot of use out of it. They had. Um, one of the unique things they did is something called JOS, the Joniac Open Shop System, and they had these electric typewriters in the mathematician's office, and they were time-sharing the machine. But what they meant by time-sharing is you got a two-hour slice of the machine, and then it would disconnect from your t teletype and connect to someone else's teletype, and they'd get two hours on the machine. And you shared the machine, but the mathematicians didn't have to go down to the computer lab, punch cards, hand them in. They could actually sit at their typewriter and they could type in commands and get instant response. And they came up with a little programming language that's sort of basic-like, that was very mathematical. But they were so limited in the memory, they only had one error message in the system. It was E-H question mark. Eh? And anything you did wrong, it said, eh? <laughs> because they figured it was better to tell you something was wrong than to misdiagnose and tell you what was wrong. And they didn't have enough memory in the computer to, to properly diagnose and translate things anyway. So one of the things we're about as a museum is not only to share this place of people who come for tours, but we have a program of talks. About once a month, we'll have some famous person in computer history come and give a talk, usually uh, just across the street in the training center. And we videotape that. And that goes into the archive as part of the permanent record. The talks are free and open to the public. We have one coming up on Monday. And this is going to be a little different. This is going to be venture capitalists who funded the computer industry in this valley, talking about the business side of computing. But we had a talk here a few years ago where we had the chief hardware designer, the chief software designer, and the head of the computer science department of RAND sit in front of this machine when this room wasn't quite as full and we could put some chairs in for the talk. And they, for an hour and a half, shared, oh, remember when Bob did this, or Fred did this, or we did this because of that. And many stories, the richness of the computer history came out about this machine that had never been written down. Little things like it's afraid of the dark and some other things. So if you're interested, if you go to our website, there's a transcript of that talk, and you can read about why this machine was afraid of the dark. So I encourage you to participate not only in the tour today, but come at other times for these, these talks. You can get the schedule on our website. and just You just let us know you're coming and, and show up for these talks. So, so that's one of the things I, I want to say, stepping in my other role of, of training here, is I tend to keep the very first part of the tour, the introduction part, very short. And then I fit in the other elements we want to talk about throughout the tour. So I'll talk about the history of the computer museum at some point. I'll talk about the, the talks. I'll talk about our volunteer program at different
points throughout the tour to keep that introductory part really short. I don't like to stand here for 15 minutes and tell people all this stuff, and they're just looking around and not paying attention. They want to be able to hear what's going on. So the next stop is in front of the stage over here. Alongside what was the last I'm also trying to stay on Are you on, Betsy? Yes. Okay, so you're walking alongside what was the last SAGE system in operation. This was decommissioned in the mid 1980s. And this was what protected North America from those terrible Russians. Um, I lived through this. Some of you from your age, I'm sure, also lived through it. But in the, the time of the 50s and 60s, we were going through an era called the Cold War, where we were firmly convinced that the Russians were going to come possibly over the polar route with their bombers and drop nuclear bombs on the United States. And, and the, the whole country was so worried about that that the government funded what was then and still is the largest ever computer development in existence. They went to MIT that had developed a machine called the Whirlwind. They had planned a second machine called Whirlwind II, and they took that design, hired IBM as the prime contractor, and they wound up building a series of computers, 23 computer installations around North America, to monitor North American defenses. It was sort of modern traffic control. And for almost 25 years, these machines operated in, in these bunkers connected to all the radar installations and allowed people to track what was happening in the skies over North America. They were typically in a four-story concrete building where one floor was power and air conditioning, one floor was the computer itself, and you see here about a tenth of the computer. This is one part of the calculating machine. <coughs> The maintenance panel is next to it. One of the core memory uh, cabinets is there. Behind it's the drum memory. And one whole floor would be a completely redundant computer setup. Another floor would be display terminals like this. And then a, the fourth floor would be for offices and staff use. And all day long, 24-7, there'd be people sitting in front of these consoles monitoring what's happening with the radar, and they could use this light pen to point at a particular radar trace and get more information to determine what was going on. And if they needed to, they could talk to their buddy over at an intercept station to scramble the intercept planes to go out after these, uh, these Russian bombers. Largest ever computer development. IBM, as I said, was prime contractor, but just about every computer manufacturer was a subcontractor on this. And IBM made so much money on this system alone that that funded the company and made them as successful as they are because of, of the tremendous funding of, of what was happening. They also pioneered a lot of things, modems, redundancy. There was actually two systems running at the same, or, or two systems in the, uh, in the facility, one would be running the application while the other one was going through preventive maintenance, and then they'd switch. We talked about mean time between failure of the Johnny Act being several hundred hours. This one was specified to have no more than 10 minutes of failure in a year. And, and they actually achieved it because of this total redundancy and switching back and forth. And it just amazes me that as recently as the early 80s, this tube machine was still operating at that kind of reliability. I mean, it cost a lot of people and work and time and material to make that happen, but that was how important it was. This particular one was in um, sort of the Canadian equivalent of Cheyenne Mountain. This was buried in a mountain, and Gwen and Gordon Bell, who founded this computer museum some 20 years ago back in Boston, actually were invited to see the machine as it was installed and was being decommissioned, and then it was given to the, to the museum. And that really is the start of this museum that back in the, um, in the 80s, the, there was a sense between Gordon Bell and Gwen Bell and Ken Olson, who was the, uh, the founder and president of Digital Equipment Corporation, that they wanted to preserve the history of computing. So digital started with a small museum that was headed by Gwen, actually, and then they moved to downtown Boston and incorporated as a nonprofit organization where they thrived for a while. 
they kept collecting historic computers, but they found they didn't have enough draw of people coming <coughs> just for the historic computer stuff. So they added more like the tech museum, um, exhibits about computer technology and how it operates. You could bring field trips of students to. So the historic stuff they, that they really cared about, they kept collecting, but uh, most of it was in the warehouse. There was only a small portion that was displayed, and more and more of the exhibits were the computer technology exhibits. Finally, that museum was um, merged with the Boston Science Museum. And a professor here, about 10 years ago at Stanford, uh, Len Schustick, decided that he wanted to send his computing students out to see real computers. And he was amazed that there was no history museum in the whole you know, Bay Area, but certainly in the West Coast. And he heard about this collection back in Boston. By then, Gordon and Gwen were out here on the West Coast, and the three of them worked to deal with the museum back there to start a satellite facility, the Computer Museum History Center. And we legally transferred all of these artifacts and all the historic things out here to California. And we moved them out here about five years ago. And so now we've reincorporated in the last few years as just the Computer History Museum. We have the entire collection and the Boston portion of the original Computer Museum is no more. It's a few exhibits in the Boston Science Museum, but that's sort of our legacy of, of history. So let's uh, continue down uh, this way. There's lots of different ways that, that I've given this tour before, and I can concentrate on the people involved, or the technology, or the companies, or um, memory systems. There's lots of different things. But what I typically do is give a generic tour where I talk a little bit about each of those. So I'll talk about history and what's going on in the world with both the ENIAC and the SAGE. I will talk about technology of memory here at the core memory plane. And I'll talk about people when we, when we move from here down to the 6600 and talk about Seymour Cray. So I give them a little smattering of each of the different areas. But I like stopping here for two reasons. One is to talk about the NTDS machine and the little character, and to talk about core. And, and to say, basically what happened is, computers sort of grew out of the existing technology. And when computers were first developed, electronic computers, uh, in the late 40s, they needed some memory. Initially just for the data, but once they had the concept of stored programs, they needed it for storage of the programs as well. And what they used was the technology currently available which was vacuum tubes, mercury delay lines, storage scopes, and so on. But in the mid-1950s, three separate organizations came up with a concept called core memory. And you see here an example of core memory out of the SAGE machine. And actually, we, for display purposes, we've sort of folded this out. Normally, this is a stack of core planes, 16 high on top of this one. And from the mid-1950s, on until the 70s and even the early 80s for military applications, this was the main computer memory. It just had so many wonderful characteristics that every computer manufacturer built their computers using core memory. And, and the way it works is basically each of these planes is another bit of the word. So this has, uh, I think, 64K words of memory, and it's 16 bits per word. And this is bit 0, bit 1, bit 2, bit 3 of each word. And literally, this is address 0, bit 0, address 0, bit 1, address 0, bit 2, and so on. And the reason for separating it that way is they could read out simultaneously from each core plane all the bits of one word. They didn't have to read it sort of serially, so it goes a little bit faster. And core memory operates this way. There's a little donut here of ferrous material that's magnetized. And it can either be in a clockwise or counterclockwise direction, 0 or 1. And you can change which way the magnetism is oriented by feeding a wire through it, feeding sufficient current through the wire to flip the core either in a clockwise or counterclockwise direction. If you feed the current through the core this way, you might flip it this way to be a zero. If you feed the current through the opposite way, it flips it to be a one. Zero, one, back and forth. But it's always one or the other. You never lose the magnetism of the core, and it takes no power to remember. Once you've flipped the core the way you want, no power is required for it to remember it. So the military liked this a lot because you think about a satellite or something else, 
takes no power to keep that memory. We've had machines here, the 1620 I'll talk about later, where we could power it up 20 years later and would still have what it had in it when it was last powered up. So that's, that's the importance of core. So the way they did it is instead of having one wire go through, they actually have a grid of XY lines and they feed half the current necessary to flip a core through the X and half through the Y and only the core at the intersection has enough current to flip one way or the other. And they'll feed the current through this way for a zero, let's say, or this way for one, and they'll flip the core the right way. So, but how do you know what's in the core? Well, here's a little trick. They have another wire called the sense wire that zigzags through this core frame. And it's a property of physics that if you have a uh, magnetism, lines of magnetism, that you pass by a wire. It's called cutting the wire with the lines of magnetism. It induces a pulse. So what they literally did is, if they want to know what that bit is, they'd write a zero into it. Now, if it was already a zero, nothing happened. If it was a one, it had to flip. The magnetic lines of force would move. They'd cut through this sense wire and generate a pulse. So they write a zero. And if you get a pulse out, you knew it was a one. But unfortunately, you just destroyed it. So core memory was always done in two cycles for reading. One cycle to destructively read out the data, and a second cycle to write back in the data that wasn't there before. Writing only takes one cycle, but reading takes two cycles. It's kind of backwards from how we think about things normally. And as I say, this is the main technology of computers. And the only thing that changed is this is from the mid-1950s. This is from the mid-1960s. The cores got smaller, so you could, they were more dense. You could have more memory. It took less power to flip them. They could flip faster, so you had faster cycle times. But the basic technology of how core works didn't change from the mid-1950s on until the 80s. It's just, yeah, it, they got cheaper, faster, smaller, better. I mean, in all ways, it got better. But the basic physical properties of core didn't change. Do you want to change the tape? Okay. This is a good stopping point.